Harvest family. Good morning. It's good to be able to gather together with you in worship this morning. My name is Grant, I'm pastor of Harvest, and I trust you found the bulletin on your way in. Hopefully it was handed to you. You can also access them online at harvestpress.com slash sermons. Get a copy of the bulletin there if you want to follow along electronically. I would note for you, those of you that are new to us in your pew rack, there should be a little card that looks like this. Connection card, you can uh, fill as much of that out as you would like and drop it in the offering plate as it passes by. That will help us get to know you a little bit and uh, connect you with various uh, folks here in the life and ministry of the church. We love to facilitate that relationship. So if you haven't already done so, please fill one of those out, drop it in the plate, and that will help us. Help us get to know you and you get to know us. Uh, so I would note for you a number of announcements on pages 10 and 11 of the bulletin. Uh, particularly want to draw your attention to the fact that Dan and Melanie Norville are in Nairobi, Kenya right now, looking the parts of and they plan to come back on Tuesday of this week. So continue to pray for them and uh, getting back from the continent of Africa can be a little challenging at times, so pray for their trip back on Tuesday. We look forward to hearing from them all about their time there in Nairobi once they're back. Also, the trip to Fairmont, West Virginia is uh, still in, in the works. Ken Counts is one of contact for that. So if you're interested, be in touch with him yesterday. It would be great. Uh, also, on page 11 there, under the Stay Connected portion, particularly want to draw your attention to the directory heading. Uh, there, it's by way of announcement, We're trying to keep our church directory up to date, and that directory is on your phone. Um, it's Instant Church Directory is the app. Uh, would love for you to download that app if you haven't done so already. Jim Turner uh, administers that, so if you have questions about that, we'll get in touch with Jim. Uh, it's a great way, if you can't remember somebody's name, you go to the app and go, oh, all right, that's who that was. Um, so it saves you the embarrassment, or you could just go up to them and say, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, which is fine. We all understand. It's okay. Um, better to be in a relationship than to avoid it just because. But anyway, the directory app is a really helpful tool, um, so please uh, keep that up to date and be in touch with Jim with any questions that you have. The hour is upon us, my friends, to worship God together. This is something different than what we do all week. In many ways, it should be the overflow and extension of what we do during the week. But there's a different way when we, the people of God, gather together. There's a different way that God is present with us than when you were by yourself with your tea or coffee and your Bible open. Which is good. You should be with your Bible open alone. But when we gather together, God is present in a unique, special way. And so it's right for us, before we just jump right into the service, it's good and right for us to take a moment and prepare our minds and our hearts. So before we call one another to worship from Psalm 50, let's take a moment of silent prayer, prepare ourselves for the worship of Almighty God. Responsibly from Psalm 50. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of the mighty, God shines forth. Our God comes. He does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest. All the heavens above to the earth. 
God's people set together. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Take now a few moments to be honest with ourselves and before the Lord about our need for Him, about our failures to live up to this these longings that we have just expressed, our genuine by faith desires to be more and more like Jesus. To long to be more like Jesus is obviously an acknowledgement that we are not like Jesus. And so He calls us to confess that reality to look to Him for the grace and the strength to grow and change. So it will be a call to confession here out of Psalm 15 and Hebrews chapter 10. And then we will confess our sin and need together in unison in prayer. Uh, page 6 of our book. So hear these words from Psalm 50 as a call to confession. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your poles, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sacrifice. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And perform your vows to the Most High, and call upon me in a day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Let's pray to Almighty, merciful God, we acknowledge for ourselves, and we confess for you that which is the truth, namely, that you decide to consider merits or worthiness. We would not be worthy to lift our eyes to heaven and bring our prayer before you. For our consciences accuse us and our sins testify against us. We also know that you are a righteous judge who punishes the sins of those who transgress your commands. But, O oh Lord, since you commanded us to call upon you every affliction, and promise in your unspeakable mercy to hear our prayers, not for the sake of our merits, of which there are none, but for the sake of the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom you have set forth as our mediator and advocate, so we forsake all other help to take our refuge in your mercy. the gracious words of the Lord Jesus to all who look to him by faith. Our sins are forgiven. The blood of Jesus covers them sufficiently and eternally. The Holy Spirit lives with you who look to Christ by faith. You are God's. And he is yours. Rejoice. Please join your hearts and minds with me as I lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Abba, Father, you can bind the cluster of the seven sisters. You can cut the cords of Orion. You can bring forth the constellations in their season and guide the bear with its cub. Only you know the ordinances of heaven. Only you set their dominion over the earth. I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not his own. It is not in a man who walks to direct his steps. O Lord, 
correct me. Correct me, but with justice. Not in your anger, lest you reduce me to nothing. Search our hearts and reveal areas of unconfessed sin. And help us to acknowledge these sins. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your Son who takes away the sin of the world. And let us receive the words of wisdom. Hear us, O Lord, and be merciful to us. O Lord, be our helper. Turn our mourning into dancing. Remove our sackcloth and close us with gladness. May our hearts sing praise to you and not be silent. For I will give your thanks to you forever. Lord, give us greater love and compassion for others. Greater love and compassion for our loved ones. Greater love and compassion for those who do not know Christ. Greater love and compassion for those in need. Lord, we know of many in need this morning, especially the need of physical healing. So we pray for Grant's mom that she will continue to gain strength and be relieved of her pain. We pray for continued healing for Ron, for George, for Bruce and Susan. Open up our hearts and minds to your word. Help it to bring us to a place of repentance and trust in the work of your son. Lord, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Let us pray to our Lord that he will send out workers into his harvest. Help us to share the good news of your son and the hope that is within us with our friends, with our relatives, with our neighbors, with our co-workers. We pray for Dan and Melanie. We thank you that they were able to take Bibles to this orf the, orf uh, the orphans in Nairobi. We pray that you would continue to bless them with travel mercies. And we pray for the orphans, Lord, that they would come to know your son, his work, and be counted upon as your adopted sons and daughters. Lord, you are our hiding place and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. Every word of yours is tested. You are a shield to those who take refuge in you. Our days are like a lengthened shadow, and we will wither away like grass. But you, O oh Lord, will endure forever. The remembrance of your name to all generations. You lay the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. They will all wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now continue to worship him by the giving of his tithes and our offerings.
our text for the morning, I do want to say a word of thanks to you for uh, your prayers for my mother. She remains in hospital in the rehab section uh, in Pennsylvania. She went in with an initial lung infection that has been able to get cleared up, which we praise the Lord. But while in hospital, she suffered not from a fall, but something. Uh, she suffered a compression fracture in one of her vertebrae and uh, is dealing with an immense amount of pain. OTs and PTs are working hard, um, and she is progressing, but she doesn't feel like it. She is making progress. I was able to be up in Pennsylvania for a couple of days this week, uh, give my dad some relief from the hospital, and my sister came down as well from Michigan, so we were able to spend good time together as a family. Um, we may or may not have broken a couple of the visitation rules, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but so thank you for praying for mom. Dad, uh, those of you that have cared for someone in the hospital, you know the toll that that takes. So we're going on three weeks, it's three weeks in the hospital. So I um, appreciate your continued prayers for them. They're talking about discharge on Wednesday of this week, which we're right before. Um, but there's certainly still a long road ahead as mom recovers from, uh, might be too much to say, broken back, but there's a lot of pain there. So, would you come now to John 18, verses 28 and following? And the text before us is essentially Jesus before Pilate. Thus far in the Gospel of John, Jesus' conflict with the Jewish leaders has been bubbling over up through the first 12 chapters. Then, chapters 13 to 17, Jesus is in private, he's alone with his disciples. The upper room. Uh, that's where we see Jesus washing the disciples' feet. They celebrate Passover together. We have Jesus' uh, longer uh, discourse on the coming of the Holy Spirit and what his followers are to do and be like after he has left. But also, then in chapter 17, we saw Jesus in prayer and praying for not only his apostles, but for those who believe uh, in, in Christ through their message. In chapter 18, we, the first part of chapter 18, we saw Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane being arrested, uh, Judas' betrayal, and now Jesus is, uh, he's been ushered into, um, into Pilate, and, and his trial, as it were, has begun. This is all because the Jewish leaders, they, they can no longer abide Jesus' claims of authority. He's made very clear who he is and what he's about. And the Jewish leaders understand something of what that means. He's making a universal claim to divinity and to power. And the Jewish leaders have a nicely ordered structure and system that Jesus has thrown off. They don't like that. For the Jews, Jesus is a threat that must be dealt with. Jesus is disrupting their power, and so they have to get rid of him. Jesus has been betrayed by Judas. The Jews arrest Jesus, but they don't in themselves anymore have the authority to kill him. The Romans uh, had revoked the, uh, the Jewish leader's authority to exercise capital punishment. They can no longer do that. So, in order to get Jesus killed and be uh, legal in the eyes of the Romans, they had to get the Roman governor on board. So they go to Pilate, the governor of this region where Jerusalem was, appointed by the Roman emperor. They need Pilate to sign off on this execution. The text before us this morning is that attempt of the Jews to get Pilate to agree to kill Jesus. And it needs to be noted that this is all under the sovereign hand of God. And all according to his purpose. We read later in the book of Acts chapter 2 that all of this happened according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So this is all happening under the oversight, as it were, under the umbrella of God's sovereign plan and purpose. 
and it is all for the good of all who will believe in Jesus Christ. So then let us give our attention to the reading and preaching of God's Word. John 18, beginning at verse 28, and we'll read from chapter 19, verse 16. Then they, that is the Jewish religious leaders, led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to. So Pilate entered his headquarters again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting. That I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he'd said this, he went back outside of the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Arrayed in a purple robe, they came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! He struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man! When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take it yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he's made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, Will you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic God. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. So they delivered him over, he delivered them him over to them to be crucified. Beloved, this is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Father, you have spoken, and your word is true. It is truth. So would you now open our ears that we might hear it? Unstop our ears. Unclog the pathways of our minds that we might understand. Remove the calluses and the calcifications on our hearts so that we might receive your word. Father, animate us then that we might live your word. All so that you might be glorified in and through us. Your people. In Jesus' name. Here's the question for the morning. What voices are you listening to? In the cacophony of noise and voices that surround us day in and day out, what voices are you listening to? We hear lots of voices, don't we? And some voices have a particular way that our, our ear latches on to them were attuned to. Uh, moms know the particular sound of their child's cry. There could be 12 children in the nursery, all crying at the same time. Mom could walk down the hallway and know if hers is crying or not. <clears throat> children know the particular sound of their parents' voice. You could be in the fellowship hall on a Sunday night, and all the children are running around like crazy people. And all the parents are squabbling, squawking at the kids. But as soon as little Johnny hears his dad's voice, he stops. We have certain voices that we're attuned to. A number of years ago, when I was little Johnny's age, little Johnny doesn't exist, I was 12, maybe 13. My family took a trip. I've told parts of this story before. <coughs> and one of the places that we stopped was a gorge out west. And it was the scene of a forest fire where the fire had jumped from one side of this canyon, one side of this gorge, to the other side of the gorge. There's this, I don't know how many hundreds of yards it was across from one edge to the other. Not Grand Canyon large, but three, four hundred yards across this gorge. That means that there's this massive canyon in between the two sides, and this was noteworthy because of what the fire had done there. So they made a pull-off for the cars where you could park, and because it was a gorge and it sloped down dramatically to the river floor below, you couldn't see because it was so far down and how steep the drop-off was. They had built a retention wall there, the parking lot, to hold the parking lot so that it didn't fall off into the gorge. Well, on the back side of that retention wall were stones. And I thought this would be a great time to scare my mom. So my brilliant plan was to exit the parking lot and crawl across, climb across the vertical structure of this retaining wall and pop up on the other side and scare my mom. It was a full proof, plain, <laughs> made in the mind of a 12-year-old. <laughs> Partway across, one of the rocks let go. And I fell. I got on my backside, and I'm sliding down the sandy soil, and all that I can see is 20 yards below me, maybe 30, it drops off, and I can't see anything beyond it. And I'm sliding, and I can't stop. And I see out of the corner of my, my brother, my older brother, come running to me. But I don't hear anything except three words. The desperate cry of 
big huge fall. I've never heard my mother that loud or that pained before. Now, in the Lord's kindness, I stopped. I think there was an intro like that. There's no good reason why I should have stopped. Brother was able to help me out, out of the gorge, out of the area I call him, and we left. But that phrase, that scream, did he fall? There's nothing like it I've ever heard in my life for a little while. And hopefully not anything I'll ever hear again. Now, of course, my mom probably warned me at some point in that trip, maybe even when we got out of the car, be careful. Right? She said, no, no, be careful. And I probably heard those words, but I didn't listen to them. Listening to the right voices is essential for wise living. Listening to the right voices is essential to wise living. So, what voice? Are you listening to? Not just which voices do you hear. What voice are you listening to? What voice are you taking, are you making central to who you are? What voice are you taking in? What voice are you reflecting upon? What voice are you listening to? Now in our text, Pilate's hearing lots of voices. As you see in this movement that Pilate's in, he's Inside his headquarters, he's outside. He's inside, he's outside. Four or five times he goes back and forth between Jesus and between the Jews. And he's trying to make sense of this situation. It's been thrust upon him. He's going back and forth between the Jewish leaders and Jesus. And he's hearing all their voices. He's hearing what the Jewish religious leaders are saying. And he's hearing what Jesus is saying. And he's trying to make sense of it. He's trying to see his way through. The Jewish religious leaders, since they're not allowed to execute Jesus, which is clearly what they want to have happen, they've made their objective clear, but they don't have the political ability to do it. They have the theological, biblical authority to execute someone who makes themselves out to be God. And they attempted that a number of times earlier in John God, picking up stones and throwing them. That always failed. So now they've ramped it up to where they need the political backing of the government to execute this enemy of theirs. Pilate, doesn't, he's, he doesn't care about their theological squabbles. Why would he care? He's a Roman. You Jews do your own Jew thing. I don't care. But they come to him and say, no, he's, he's making himself out to be a king. He's putting himself in a position of authority. You wouldn't want that now, would you, Pilate? You wouldn't want in your region, you wouldn't want there to be some upstart political rival to you or to Caesar, would you see the political savvy of the Jewish leaders? They're choosing the politically expedient argument. How can we get Pilate on our side? And in that, Pilate's asking lots of questions. I mean, there's probably a dozen or more questions that Pilate asks out of the Jews, or Jesus is trying to figure this all out. And maybe you notice in chapter 18, verse 37, when uh, Pilate says, you're a king, Jesus says, you say that I'm a king, for this purpose I come to the world and bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Well, Pilate cues, though, on the wrong piece of Jesus' statement. Pilate says what is true. What he should be asking is, who are you? Are you? True. Jesus says, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Jesus is drawing attention to himself, and Pilate wants to have a philosophical debate in front of him. The truth is staring him in the face, and Pilate misses it. 
outside able to see who it is that's in front and what it is that is in front of him. See, Pilate's not receptive to Jesus. He's not open to Jesus because Pilate is concerned about maintaining his position and his power. The Jews knew that. That's why they brought the argument that they brought. You want to be a friend of Caesar, right? They knew how to get Pilate to do what they wanted him to do. Pilate didn't want to upset the status quo. Because Pilate fears me. He doesn't fear God. Pilate's more concerned what Caesar's going to think about him. Pilate's more concerned about what the Jews are going to think about him than he is about the God who stands before him in flesh and blood. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Pilate is miscalculating here. He's misunderstanding. He's not taking Jesus for who Jesus is. He's listening to the wrong voices. Pilate's seeking to appease people instead of receive the truth from God. Pilate asks, what is truth when truth was standing right in front of him? But Pilate's not able to see truth because his vision has been clouded by the fear of man. He's hearing Jesus, but he's not listening to him. Now in this, we have to note the willing submission of Jesus to this whole process. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's the creator of all things. And already in John, we've seen Jesus give sight back to those that are blind. We've seen Jesus take a couple loaves of bread and feed thousands of people. We've seen Jesus take water and turn it into wine. We've seen Jesus raise people from the dead. He is God Almighty in flesh and blood with divine power and authority. And yet here he is submitting himself to an unjust process. Willing. Yet willingly he to suffering goes, as we just said. In chapter 19, verse 11, in verse 10, backing up, Pilate said to Jesus, who will not speak to me? Don't you know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? I'll say, hey, hey, don't you know who I am? I ask you a question, you better give me an answer. Because I have the authority to let you go, and I have the authority to kill you. So, Mr. Jesus, King of the Jews, as Pilate loves to refer to him as, ironically, sarcastically, so, Jesus, don't you think you better speak up? Because of the authority that I have. Jesus' response to him in verse 11 is, you, you, have to, you have no idea who you're talking about. You have no idea who you are or where you got your authority. You wouldn't have any authority if it hadn't been given to you from above. Essentially, Jesus is saying, if I hadn't given you authority, you wouldn't have any authority. In this moment, Jesus is submitting himself who is the creator of Pilate, the creator of authority, the giver of Pilate's authority. He submitted, Jesus is submitting himself to that very unjust use of authority. It's amazing. If he had wanted to, Jesus could have removed Pilate's authority in this moment. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Jesus could have ended Pilate's life like that. He gave Pilate his life. He could have stopped his heart. But he didn't. He could have undone the things that bound him and grabbed his sword and chopped Pilate's head clean off. 
Or he could have sent angels to do it, but he didn't. He submitted himself to an unjust exercise of authority, misappropriation of authority. He allows himself to be misunderstood, mischaracterized, mistreated. Because of his love for God. Jesus' commitment throughout his earthly life and ministry was to do God's will, to accomplish God's plan and purposes. Jesus isn't going to here at the end, he's not going to rebel against those purposes and plans. He's going to submit to them because he loves his Father. Why does Jesus submit himself to unjust authority? Because he loves God. Because he loves you. Because if he hadn't loved you, if he hadn't submitted himself to this, if he had taken matters into his own hands, as it were, and ended Pilate's life, or removed Pilate's authority, or in some way thwarted the plan of God, there would be no salvation for you. There would be no forgiveness of sins. There would be no atonement. There would be no gift of righteousness. There would be no hope of resurrection. But because of his love for you, he submitted himself to all of that. Because he loves you and is bringing you home. Buying you back. Earning for you that which you could never earn for yourself, even if you had a thousand lifetimes to live. Why does Jesus submit to this perversion of authority and justice? Because he loves God and because he loves you. And beloved, we've got to enter into that. We've got to believe that that's true. You see, it's one thing to hear. Jesus say these things. It's one thing to, to hear, it's another thing to own it and believe it. In the 19th century, there was a Scottish Presbyterian minister named Horatius Bonar. Now, he had a couple of brothers, John and Andrew, who were also Presbyterian Scottish ministers. One of the hymns, one of the beautiful things about Horatius Bonar's life was his writings. He wrote a number of uh, profoundly beautiful books, but also over 600 hymns. One of the great ironies of that was in his church context, they only sang psalms. <laughs> and yet he wrote over 600 hymns. At one point, I read when he, toward the end of his life, when you get older, you're willing to take more risks, I guess, he decided to sing two of his hymns in church. Two of his elders stood up and walked. One of the hymns that he wrote is called, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say. And it's a profound and beautiful reflection on these dynamics of hearing what Jesus says, but having to own them, having to take those words, having to take those promises and believe them and live our lives in light of them. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, O weary one, lay down your head upon my breast. I came to you as I was, so weary, worn, and sad. I found in him my resting place, and he has made me glad. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give the living water thirsty one. Stoop down, drink, and live came to Jesus, and I drank from that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in Him. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise, and all your days be bright. 
I looked to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life, I'll walk till pilgrim days are done. Whose voice are you listening to? We have, we hear lots of voices. And we have a choice to make. Every day we have choices to make. Which voice am I going to listen to? You have choices to make. Pilate had choices to make. He chose wrong. The Jewish leaders had choices to make about which voice they would listen to, and they chose wrong. Jesus had a choice to make about which voice he would listen to. He chose right. And praise God. Out of his love for his Father and his love for you, he chose right. So which voice will you listen to? The voice of your own heart? The voice of our culture? The voice of the self-help gurus? The voice of your enemies? Will you listen to the voice of God himself? The voice of truth? It speaks in the, into the cacophony of noise. It sometimes speaks in a whisper. Whose voice are you listening to? I wonder if some of the voices that you hear might be along these lines. The voice of self-hatred. You probably hear it. You may not utter it to other people. But you hear the voice of self-hatred, you worthless mess. You don't deserve these good things. You certainly don't deserve to be loved. God might love other people. He's not going to love you. Pathetic piece of trash. It's a powerful voice, isn't it? But in those moments, the voice of Jesus speaks as well when you listen. Isaiah 43 tells us, You are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. That is your Savior speaking to you. You are precious in my eyes. You are honored in my eyes. I love you. Will you listen to that voice? Close friend to the voice of self hatred, to the voice of self doubt. Ah, you're not really cut out for this. You can't do this Christian life thing. This task is for you at work. Parenthood? Forget that. Other people are good parents. You're going to stay. You hear the voice of self doubt? You're not strong enough. You're one of the weak ones. You're not going to be able to do what you're being called to do, the voice of self-doubt. When self-doubt speaks, so does the voice of Jesus, the voice of truth, who tells us, you have my spirit in you. John chapters 14, 15, and 16, Romans chapter 8, Testify to us that yes, in ourselves we are weak. Philippians chapter 4. But in Christ, with Christ, His Spirit is in us, with us, strengthening us. In Him we can do all things. The voice of self doubt wants you to believe that you can't do anything. But the voice of Jesus says, You have my Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, Christian. Will you listen to that voice? Now, on the other end of the voice spectrum, we might also hear the, belt, the voice of self-importance, the voice of arrogance, the voice of pride. That 
wants you to organize your life around you. You are the most important thing in the world. Everyone should be doing what you want them to do. You are the smartest person in the room. How stupid are the rest of these people they don't recognize the brilliance of your idea? How dare they? Where do they get off thinking that they can challenge you? The voice of self interested pride, self-importance, wants you to be the center of the universe. At the same time, the voice of Jesus speaks and says, I am King of kings and Lord of lords. Voice of pride wants to make us the center of the universe. And Jesus says, I am. Will we listen? Will we allow the voice of truth to quiet the voice of pride, arrogance, self importance? Some of us may hear the voice of isolation. voice that says you are all alone. There's nobody with you. No one knows you. No one cares about you. Nobody has your back. You are utterly and completely alone. At the same time, the voice of Jesus speaks clearly in his word. I am with you, and I will never leave you. Isaiah 43, verse 2. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will not forsake his people. The voice of isolation says you are utterly and completely alone, and no one has your back. But Jesus says, I am with you, and I will never be. And I am brave. Isolation says no one has your back. Jesus says, I got your front too. I'm praying for you. Right now. You have before the Father your older brother, Jesus the Son. Praying for don't believe the lie that says you're all alone. Because in Jesus' world, you're not. Beloved, well, which voice are you listening to? There, I'm sure there may be some other voice that plagues you, some other lie from the evil one. But I guarantee that whatever lie the evil one tries to lob at you, there is truth in Jesus to counteract and contradict that lie. Because he is true. He is the truth. And in him there is no, no deception. What voice are you listening to? And lastly, I want to ask, what are we doing to foster our listening to the voice of Jesus? Infants become attuned to the voice of their mother long before they are able to say mama or express their gratitude, rationally comprehend that I can pick my mother's voice out of the crowd. Infants learn the sound of their mother's voice. What are we doing to foster our learning of our Father's voice? What practices, what, what uh, rhythms in your life are in place so that your ear can be more attuned to the Father's voice? Are we listening to the Word of God? That's where God speaks to you. By and with the Word. So to what extent is our life shaped around the Word of God? so that we might listen. Are we engaged and attentive in worship? 
God shows up here in a different way than he does when you are by yourself. Do you come into the sanctuary on Sunday morning after Sunday morning expecting God to be here? Because he promises to. Where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. A promise from Jesus. Are we attentive and engaged in corporate worship? Are we listening? Are we allowing ourselves to be shaped and formed by our weekly experience of worship so that we might be more attuned to the voice of our Father? I'm not trying to shame anybody, but the prelude begins at 1040 on Sunday morning. Every week, for a reason, so that you have time to come through those doors, and sit down, and remember what it is we are about to do. Now, I know we've got the kiddos, I get it, I totally understand. But please, take advantage of the opportunity to come in. The reason we ring the bell is not because we're curmudgeonly and we don't like you fellowshipping. It's because we want to move you into this space so that we together can engage with our Father in worship. So be attentive to the time on Sunday morning. It matters what we do in this hour. It helps you listen. It helps you hear. It helps you believe the truth. What are we doing to foster our listening? The Word of God in private, the Word of God in public, in corporate ways. It's helpful for us to evaluate our listening habits. By that, I mean actually, you know, the sound waves that we allow to come into our ear. We need to evaluate. Am I fostering things that help me listen well to God? Am I letting things in that are good for me, that help me, that move me toward Jesus? But also, we need to evaluate our listening habits in our in what happens in between those ears. No one speaks to you more than you do. Some of us speak out loud to ourselves. And it can be embarrassing when we get caught. But all of us have thoughts running through our minds all day long. What are you allowing those thoughts to do? What are you allowing yourself to meditate on? Are you listening to the voice of self-hatred? Are you rolling around in your mind the voice of self-doubt, or are you recognizing those lies for what they are and confronting them with the truth of Jesus? We need to evaluate our listening habits. Are we cultivating a, the kind of quiet spirit that's needed for good listening? An active, engaged listener is not only always preparing their rebuttal. But they're listening, they're receptive, they're open, willing to hear, willing to learn, willing to grow. Are we nurturing that kind of quiet listening spirit? What are the, the, the structures of our lives doing to foster that kind of spirit? Do we build into our lives any silence? Is there any room in your life for quiet? I know those of you that are wrestling with little ones on your life, you're like, no, have you seen what I'm doing here? I understand. But it is possible to parent little children with a quiet spirit. It's hard work. But we all have moments where we can quiet our minds, quiet our hearts, and listen. 
Have we built in your lives those kinds of moments, those kinds of structures, so that we can hear and receive from God? Whose voice are you listening to, and are you fostering godly listening? Beloved, Jesus is the way. Jesus Christ is the truth. He is the life. And all who believe in him, to them he gives life and freedom, and forgiveness, and redemption, and hope, and purpose, and strength. We've got to believe that. And one of the things that helps foster our belief is godly listening quiet spirit, so that it can get through all the other noise, and find good soil in our hearts. Let's pray. Father, your word tells us that all who believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that Jesus rose from the dead lives now, all those are saved have salvation, will be saved. And so, Father, save us. Cause us to hear your word, to combat the lies that come at us. Help us to see Jesus, to recognize him for who he is, and to live our lives accordingly. So help us to hear, to listen, to take on the Lord, our Savior, all by the power of your Spirit dwelling in us. By way of response and further reflection on the love of Jesus, the love of God to us, let's stand together and sing How Deep the Father's Love. We'll find the text, put it on page 8 of your book, and let's stand together and sing by faith.
you see it. Why should I gain? to receive it. It's a gift. Receive it. Enjoy it. Delight in it. Be the child on Christmas morning who gets lost in the joy of the new gift. That's the Christian life. This meal reminds us of so much of what we believe. Here we have on display the love of God in tangible ways that you can feel, you can smell, you can taste, you can hear if you listen well. All here. Because God loves you. He's committed to you. He's committed to fulfill the promises that he's made to you. To be your God and the God of your children at it. It's all of this. Here we have a demonstration of the love of God, the, the bread representing the broken body of Jesus, willingly to suffer and die. The wine representing the shed blood of Jesus, poured out, sufficient to atone for your sin. There's nothing lacking like in what Jesus has done for you. See? Delight in it. You'll see on page eight a few questions and answers taken from our shorter catechism. We'll use those responsibly to remind ourselves of what we have here in this uh, in this meal. Before we get to them, just a reminder that here we have the broken body of Jesus, broken for you. So too, the shed blood of Jesus shed for you. So then I ask you, Christians, what is the Lord's Supper? The Lord's Supper is a sacrament wherein, by giving and receiving bread and wine, according to Christ's appointment, his death showed forth, and the worthy receivers are not by a corporal or carnal manner, but by faith made partakers of his body and blood with all his benefits, their spiritual nourishment and growth in grace. What then is required for the worthy receiving of the Lord's Supper? It is required of them that worthily partake. Lord's Supper, that they examine themselves of their knowledge to discern the Lord's body, of their faith to feed upon Him, of their repentance, love, and new obedience, lest, coming unworthily, they eat and drink the judgment unto themselves. Let's pray then together. Lord, do help us now in these moments to eat and drink in a worthy manner. We're taught here what it is to eat and drink in an unworthy manner. And worthily then is by faith, believing that what you have said is true. Coming with joy in our hearts, confident that these promises are for us and for our children. Confident in your purpose and plan to redeem us. And not part way but to the uttermost, to redeem us all into glory forever with you. So, Father, by these elements, this bread and this wine or juice, nourish our souls, that our faith might be fed, that we might live more and more to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. In your prepared
prepared to do so, and when we're ready up here, we welcome you to come forward and receive the elements of bread and wine or juice. We would note the wine is in the common cups on either side of the table. The trays have, the outer ring of the trays is wine, the inner rings are bread juice. Uh, we welcome you to take uh, from those here on the table, outer ring wine, inner rings bread juice. There's a platter with gluten-free wafers on it. If you have need of those, no one should receive them, you go back to your seat through the center. Uh, so the men would come forward and assist, please. We will invite you to come forward when you are prepared to receive feed by faith on Jesus. Yet done so, beloved, taste, see, the gospel is true. God's people said together. Amen. Amen. 
Would you stand with me and close our service in song? And God moves in a mysterious way. Let's stand together and sing back then. Thank you. 